to uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, welcome to MOA's third meeting of spring quarter. Um, we will start now. The next slide. Um, Natalia, next slide before we're sharing. <laughs> Okay, cool. All right, before we start, we wanna go over a couple of rules and regulations. Uh, please respect officers and guest speakers during the meeting. So just by muting yourselves while the hosts are speaking and using appropriate language in the call in the chat, but please hype up the chat. We have Dr. Osborne here with us. So hype it up. It'll be a lot of fun today. And please be polite to everyone in the call and the chat. And um, Try not asking, or please don't ask any diagnostic questions, uh, Amy. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, any disruptions or members who do not respect the Zoom meeting rules? Um, I hate to say, I, I, I guess I will be kicking out people today. Isabel's not here with us, um, so but cast her wrath. She's usually the one that'll cast the wrath, but that's thankfully has never happened in the past year, no Zoom bombing has ever happened or nothing. So it's pretty great. Um, and also just know that this meeting is recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. So uh, I encourage you guys to turn on your cameras, but if you guys can't, you will be missed. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Next slide. And if you're participating in the attendance point system, remember to sign in on the Google form at the beginning of the meeting and at the end of the meeting with the word of the day. And that will be a total of three points per meeting. And if you didn't attend the meeting live, you, can, uh, you will have 24 hours to complete the form and you can still earn partial points. And at the end of the year, if you have the most amount of points, you will win a prize. And you can also um, earn bonus points if you participate in community service events, which you can find on our website. And then the sign in and sign out sheet will be linked in the chat in the beginning and at the end of the meeting. Uh, okay, so for upcoming events, um, at the moment we're still, you know, in the works of it. Oh, so we're still contacting some people, but ultimately uh, it's been determined that we will have a picnic slash field day um, on June 11th. And um, it, it will be in person, but of course we'll take the, um, the, the, what is it? What is the word? <laughs> the necessary uh, precautions or like, you know, when we meet up in person, we follow CDC and everything. Um, but yes, that is for, for sure. So book the date. Oh, it's me again. Hello. <laughs> okay. So, um, as always, the website is there for you to check out the resources. We have virtual shadowing resources and pre-med resources, as well as local volunteering opportunities if you would like to check it out. Uh, there is a QR code uh, if anybody is, uh, wants to scan it real quick to check out what we have. Okay, we can go to the next slide. And here are all of our socials and as we said earlier, all of our recordings and past meetings are on our YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and subscribe to that. And any other inquiries, you can message us on anywhere, like our email. And you can join our email list if you haven't already with the QR code on the left. And you can visit our link tree on the right with any other important links. And officer applications for the next school year are open now. And we have like the publicist, secretary, and the treasurer positions all open. And currently no one has applied for the treasurer position yet. So go ahead and apply for that. We highly encourage it. And the due date will be next Friday at noon. And you can ask any of us for any questions. All right, is that my turn? Yes, go all for it. I love the animation. All right, we tried, we tried to make this cool and fun. So guys, hopefully this will be a-, a I'm Sorry a, to interrupt you, but um, I just made you co-host. If you wanted to share a screen, if that's easier for you. Oh, well, that's, uh, um, you're asking me complicated things. Let me, let me- uh, I, can, I can just do it for you. That's okay. Okay, that's fine. I'll just okay. say. So hopefully this will be something uh, more fun than usual. Uh, you know, most of us, most of you guys are interested in the medical field. I was too at one time. Um, I was uh, planning on being a pediatrician. In fact, my grandfather was chief of staff at El Camino. 
uh, and probably he was an endocrinologist, a pediatrician, and a, um, uh, endocrinologist, pediatrician, and a um, oncologist. So pretty brilliant guy. Um, I planned on being a pediatrician, and then my sister got cancer, and I spent a lot of time in the hospital. Um, and I, I remember the doctor saying, well, um, we've done everything that we can for her. And now it's up to God to be able to heal her. Um, and I, the whole time that I was there, it was always about, you know, making her less sick. Um, you know, that you try to make somebody less sick and then, but it's like trying to make a room less dark. The only thing that you can do to make a room less dark is by opening the door to let the light in. And so, um, part of my story is I ended up, uh, I was a wrestler. I went to St. Francis high school. I was a wrestler, um, dislocated my shoulder, um, ended up having, and then went to the best doctors, right? They did all the rehab, dislocated again. Next thing you know, um, I, they told me I had to have surgery on my shoulder and I'd never be able to wrestle again. So if you remember what high school was like, you have your identity, right? You're, are you the cool kid? Are you the smart kid? Are you the funny kid? Are you the troublemaker? Are you the jock? And so I completely lost my identity uh, because that's all it was, was as, a, as an athlete. And, uh, you know, started getting in trouble, started failing out of uh, school uh, just because I was kind of lost uh, and it started having an, an arrhythmia in my heart at 16 years old. And they said, well, your, your dad has an arrhythmia, so it's genetic. You're going to have an arrhythmia. Here's the arrhythmia medication. And then they said, uh, but one of the side effects of the arrhythmia medication is heartburn. So they gave me heartburn medication at 16, which the side effect of heartburn medication is actually heart arrhythmias. Uh, and so we fast forward about four months. I was on six different medications where I was uh, like a, an incredible athlete at that time. And my, somebody said, hey, let's go to the chiropractor. And I'm like, what's a chiropractor? And then they said, I have no idea. I mean, I had no idea. So we just went and he told me what we're gonna talk about today. And I decided that that's what I wanted to do. Um, so uh, next, next screen. So here's kind of where we are today. Um, this is my x-ray right here, um, back when I was 16 years old. And so normally when you look at an x-ray from, from the side, you're gonna see a nice smooth curve in the neck. And you can, if you look, the spaces in between uh, the, what we call the, the discs, they should be nice, thick and fat. And if you look in the middle, the one's really thin right there. So that was the nerve that goes to my shoulder. And so the chiropractor said, well, what's, what, what's your problem? I said, well, my muscles won't hold my shoulder into place. And he said, what controls the muscles that go to your shoulder? And I'm like, I don't know. And he said, look, your brain controls the function of your entire body. It sends messages down the spinal cord, out the nerves to every single tissue, cell and organ. So if you have pressure on those nerves, is your shoulder ever gonna work right? And I said, I don't think so. He goes, well, yes or no? And I said, no. I said, okay, so what do we need to do? We gotta get the pressure off. And so next slide. So this is my neck afterwards. Um, you can see I have a nice smooth curve there. On the left side, when you lose that curve, like let's say you're looking down at your phone or looking at a computer all day long. Um, typically when you lose that neck curve, it stretches that spinal cord um, six to nine centimeters. So would you guys say that'd be a good thing or a bad thing? Just thumbs down if it's a bad thing, right? So what ends up happening is, is that when it's like a pair of Chinese handcuffs, when you drop your head down, it chokes it. And you can actually see on the right side is a cross section of what the spinal cord looks like when somebody's, when somebody's lost their neck curve. On the right side, you can actually see the nice round fat. That's what a spinal cord looks like when you have a normal neck curve. So if you think of somebody like uh, uh, Christopher Reeves, for example, who was Superman, fell down, hit his chin. Um, when he hit his chin, what ended up happening to him? He became paralyzed. Like he literally, he had to have, uh, he couldn't use his arms and his legs, but his, his, um, his um, what do you call it, was just fine. His, uh, uh, like his arm, arms and legs were fine. He just had a nervous system issue. He had a, a pacemaker stuck into his heart, not because, oh, looks like the gardener's coming. I apologize, guys. Um, but he had a pacemaker stuck into his heart, not because he all of a sudden had heart issues or was eating in an out burger or had pork rinds or something like that. He had a nervous system issue. He had a bag stuck into his intestines. Even though he could eat, afford GMO, non-GMO food, purely organic, his intestines wouldn't work. And so when I understood this, what ended up happening is I got my neck corrected, my shoulder never dislocated. I ended up going on to, uh, this is at the same time as my sister had, uh, had cancer, ended up going on to uh, uh, Cal Poly, ended up wrestling at Cal Poly uh, on full ride scholarship, met my wife my first day of school and never looked back. And that's when I, I decided to become a chiropractor. So that's the that's short story, next. 
So this is where I am now. I ended up going to uh, Palmer West. Palmer West is a chiropractic college here in San Jose. You lucked out. There's two of them that are in the Bay Area. You have one in Fremont Hayward area. And then you also have one in the San Jose area. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got was from my wife. She said, when you go to chiropractic college, you never get to do it again. So I went all in. Um, I was named student of the century, student of the year, student council president. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, towards the end, the, the, the university system, there's three Palmer schools. They, one, they asked me to be the first chiropractic congressman. And so I was on Senator Tom Harkin's healthcare, it was his healthcare advisor. Uh, but then I decided I wanted to be in clinical practice, not a politician and thank God, right? Um, I've been named doctor of the year um, by two different, the California Chiropractic Association and, uh, and by an international organization. Um, I speak all over the world. We've been recognized as one of the, the top family practices in the country. Um, I, one of the things that I'm a, I'm a firm believer in is that it's constant learning. So I'm a diplomat of the American Academy of Spinal Physicians. Um, I have advanced certifications in nutrition, spinal correction. Um, I feel like that uh, if you have something to say, write it down. Um, so I've written three books. Um, and in our office, this is a little bit old, but we've pr provided almost uh, 1.2 million adjustments in the last 25 years. Uh, which is, uh, puts us as one of the largest uh, natural healthcare providers in the state. Um, the other thing that's important is, is I think getting out into our community is super important. So um, we, I, we, we work with a lot of companies that have been in, you know, 34 to 500 companies, you know, working with the government, putting health and wellness programs together. Probably one of the funnest things that I've done, and, you know, you always, everybody wants to be the sports guy. Um, so I've worked with three different Olympic teams, the Olympic wrestling team, judo team, weightlifting team, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the volleyball team um, for uh, the 2012, 2016, and we're getting prepared for if they actually do have the Olympics here. Um, and, uh, and I still take care of the sharks and the barracudas um, as their chiropractor. And it's not just for back pain or injuries, but they actually consult us. They have me come in twice a week into their facility to help them with sports performance. So. Next slide. So I guess the question is a lot of times people are wondering, okay, what's the difference between a, a kind of a chiropractor, right? And a medical doctor. And I really think that everybody, every profession has their own philosophy. Um, and so, you know, you go to the doctor, what do the, you go to your medical doctor, what do they do? They check your blood, right? They wanna see what's happening in the blood. They, you know, you wanna find out what the diagnosis is. You wanna find out what, you know, it's all the blood tests. You know, in a chiropractor, we're looking at the nervous system. Uh, you go to medicine, it's, a lot of times people come with a complaint, you have heartburn, let's actually um, give you a medication that gets rid of your heartburn and chiropractic. We're like, okay, there's no cause that, I mean, there's no effect that doesn't have a cause. Let's actually look and see what the cause of it is rather than treating the effect. Um, unfortunately, our healthcare system is based on crisis. Most people wait until they're in crisis to actually do something about it. So many times, that's why we have hospitals. And, um, but many times we don't necessarily go to the hospital to necessarily get healthy. You go to the hospital to, to, to save you from the bad decisions that you've made over decades many times. And so our, our office is a true, uh, it's focused on making sure that people never get sick, making sure that we don't cover up the symptoms and making sure that people live an extraordinary life. Um, you know, we don't prescribe drugs. We're a drugless profession, meaning that uh, my license is what um, says that I can do everything a medical doctor does except prescribe drugs. Great news is, is that if you can't prescribe a drug, you gotta come up with a dis different solution. And I'm not saying drugs are bad. I just think there's a time and a place for everything. Um, unfortunately, in the United States, we take 70% of the medications in the entire world. Um, you know, you're set seven or more medications, 31 prescriptions by the time you're 65. And if it was just taking medications that would make people healthy, we should have people take 20, 30, 40, right? Uh, and the problem is, is most of the medications are for the side effects of the medications. And so we looked at we're in a, a healthcare crisis. We're actually not in a health crisis in this country. We're in a a crisis of people knowing what health is and how to get healthy there. So I really, this is really kind of an interesting concept that, that we really look at the, you know, we, we have in medicine, we have specialties, right? We have, you know, somebody that works, looks at your heart, somebody that looks at your intestines, somebody that looks at your ears, somebody that looks at your eyes, chiropractic, we see you as a whole, that all the parts are connected. They all should be working together. Um, and when one system's off, it's gonna affect all the rest of the systems. Um, the job is, you know, and really making your in a time like this in this COVID time, you know, we've never been busier. And the reason being is, is that all of a sudden people have this new found health. And, uh, and I really do believe that we are genetically programmed to be healthy. 
uh, rather than to be sick. And I think 2000 generations that come before us have proved that. If we were designed to be sick, then uh, we probably wouldn't uh, be around. Next. All right, so this is the nervous system on the left-hand side. Um, and, you know, I, I always put that out there is that just to remind you that most, the one system that nobody ever checks, right, is their nervous system. You know, we check our eyes, we check our ears, we check our, um, you know, like, you know, our blood pressure. We check every other thing in our body, even our teeth on a regular basis. But most people know, have no idea how their nervous system is working. And the challenge is, is that the nervous system is only 5% pain sensitive. And so because it's 5% pain sensitive, most people base their health on how they feel. Well, unfortunately, then what ends up happening is they have to wait till they're in a crisis to do something about it. And so that's why as a, as a, if I'm going to look at the one thing that's gonna have an impact on every other system of the body and the one thing that controls every single thing of the body, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the nervous system there as a starting place. Because we know that when somebody's heart stops, they don't give up doing chest compressions, but they know that when somebody's brain stops, well, that's pretty much it, right? They just pull the plug on the person at that time. So you have to, that's why there's, you know, the chiropractors, a lot of times they think about spine, but the, we actually work with the nervous system there. Um, in our office, we're very different. And we also look at, okay, so what is it, with, you know, about health? And we've come up with what we call our five essentials, obviously core chiropractic, making sure you take care of your spine and your nervous system. But we also look at your mindset, how stress is effect, affecting you and impacting you. We, we have exercise classes and we teach our patients to exercise. We look at minimizing toxins because, you know, we live in a toxic world. In fact, just here in the Silicon Valley, we have more super fun cleanup sites than any other county in the entire country. Um, you know, so I think that's a, we look at nutrition, we have uh, nutrition classes and we do nutrition consults, not just to give supplements to people, but to remind them how to eat right um, in a way that's genetically congruent with them. Next. So this is a question I get a lot of times because people are like, okay, well, what's the difference? Is it just kind of like a, um, you know, what does medical school look like versus chiropractic college? So the, the hour, course hours are relatively the same. Um, and we just have a different focus there, you know, in the time where, you know, um, you know, we're, like, we're, you know, like in medical school, you'd be studying pharmacology and, you know, general surgery and things like that. We're going to be focusing on nutrition, rehabilitation, advanced radiology, um, adjusting uh, classes and techniques. Um, there is a, a there's a, a prerequisites include 90 units of, uh, uh, of classes. So there would be, I think there's you know, science classes such as chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, um, anatomy, biology. Um, it, you don't necessarily have to have a four-year degree, but it's, uh, by the time you get to 90 units, you might as well finish there. Um, and then the application process is just like any other school. You don't have to take the MCATs, uh, but they, uh, in the application process, you, you just send in your transcripts. Really, each state is very interesting, though, because, um, you know, each, like, as far as chiropractic, there's different scope of practice. So if I go up to uh, Oregon, for example, I can actually do minor surgery with my license. Uh, if I go to Michigan, uh, the only thing I can do is um, uh, I can only touch the 24 movable segments of the spine. Um, if I go to Texas, I can do injections and chelation therapy and IVs and things like that. Um, so it's very variable from state to state. What we typically find is in the states that were more rural at one time, uh, they, they needed more doctors. So the licensing laws are more expanded there. Next. So this is my goal, okay? And so I, I, and I hopefully, you know, um, it really inspired me, but a lot of times we've, we've become, um, we've become very mediocre in what our expectations are of our health. So, you know, this on the left side, you know, it says, will you live to be 120 years old? Odds are that a vast majority of us will actually with medical technology will actually live over a hundred, probably close to 110 um, in the next couple of generations here. Um, the problem is, is how will you live is the question. Most of us don't want to live to be hundred because we don't, you know, that, you know, right now they're expecting by 20, 40, 50% of people at age 65 will have Alzheimer's or dementia. That's scary, right? Like who wants to live, like my dad actually died from um, Alzheimer's dementia and cancer at 56 years old. So that's the, my same age. So obviously I had to figure out something different because I saw what that looked like there. And so we spend our largest 
gross domestic product that this country offers is actually our healthcare system. Like we spend more on healthcare than any other country in the world. And 95% of that is spent in chronic disease. And it's, you guys think it's gonna get better or worse, right? It's only gonna get worse because we've, we're taught to manage disease, not to correct disease, right? So yeah, I agree. Healthcare is a business, right? It is a product and the product is we need sick people. Did you guys notice that during COVID when nobody was going into the hospitals, all the hospitals were complaining that they were going out of business. They, could, they, they need sick people to be in there. So on the right hand side, we have throughout our office, these are all the medications that people have gotten off of just in the first four months um, of this year. Um, so I don't go steal their medications from them. Uh, but what happens is, is that sick people take medications, healthy people don't take medications. So when healthy people get healthy, I mean, when people get healthy, they don't have a need for their medications. In fact, I got a call from a, a GP uh, um, a couple of weeks ago and he said, okay, I got to ask you what you're doing because I've been in practice for 32 years. And this is the first time I've ever taken a patient off their diabetes medication, their blood pressure medication, their cholesterol medication, and their anxiety medication. I don't take patients off medications. I just add more medications to them. What are you doing? And so we have a, I have jugs, I mean, boxes and boxes and boxes. That's some people collect stamps. I, tr I collect, it, collect empty pill bottles there. And that's my sign of success. Next. So this is my day in the life. I have three doctors in the office. I have Dr. Sherry. Um, who's been with me for 25 years. We actually went to school together and then we just combined practices a couple of years ago. Uh, we have Dr. Doss who went to the other chiropractic college in the uh, uh, East Bay, Life West. Uh, all of them are incredible people, uh, but we all work together. And so instead of having just individual patients, we all work together. So it's a, it's a nice opportunity to have three people thinking about the patient rather than one person. Um, so it's a true group practice where it's not my patients or your patients, that's our patients um, that we all work on together. Um, each of us has different strengths, each of us has different weaknesses. Next. So here's a kind of some of the things that we do. So um, on the left, that's Rulon Gardner, uh, Olympic gold medalist. Um, and uh, um, he's uh, right, and then when, in the 2012 Olympics, um, we had um, 20, uh, 29 athletes um, go to the Olympics and 17 of them medaled. Um, so if you think about the, the, the percentage, if you have 29 athletes and 17 of them medal, the one thing that all of them had in common was they're under care, chiropractic care there. What's the difference? You know, I had one of the, um, the guy that Justin Gatlin was a runner and he was, uh, uh, he's the only person that's beat Usain Bolt when Usain Bolt was in his prime. And he asked uh, Usain Bolt, I mean, I asked Just, Justin, I said, how do you plan on beating Usain Bolt? And he says, look, I train for four years for a hundredth of a second. And so at athletes at this elite caliber, everything matters. And so, for example, they've done studies when you adjust somebody, their reaction times go up 16%, the speed of their reaction, because you have 400 muscles, I mean, yeah, 400 muscles, 200 bones approximately in your body, they all have to work in perfect balance, you know, with the messages from the brain getting to those muscles at 270 miles an hour um, in perfect balance for you to be at your very best. And that's why there's no sports team that doesn't have a chiropractor working with them. There's uh, very few universities don't have a chiropractor working with them. Almost no elite athletes um, don't have a chiropractor working with them because they re recognize the impact that it has on sports and performance. Uh, we've been the, the team chiropractors at the CrossFit Games uh, for a decade. Um, this is a, one of the first uh, females uh, to be able to win. Uh, Adeline Gray, she actually became a, 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 an MMA fighter, um, if, you, if you follow MMA. But she got her, uh, uh, she got her belt next. So these are, that's what, it, what do the athletes do. Then we have our celebrities. Um, um, and so, this is Simon LeBon at the, on the left-hand side. Um, an 80s band. Um, any, does anybody know who that is? Larry the Cable Guy. Um, so we see a lot of people. I used to go to uh, Shoreline and I was the official chiropractor for Shoreline. So I'd go backstage and adjust all the uh, people backstage, um, you know, whether it was Aerosmith or Peter Gabriel or Sting. So the, the point of the reason why I'm saying this is that you don't have to put yourself into a hole. That's the beautiful thing about chiropractic. The only thing that you need is these wherever you go. 
and it's a universal, you don't, it's, you don't have to, that it, it's all about helping people be better at what they do. And sometimes we get so complicated, right? We think that things have to, being healthy has to be so complicated for me. I'm like, look, don't eat bad food, move your body. Don't think bad thoughts. Uh, don't put toxins into your body and, uh, and, and keep your nervous system free and clear. And you're probably going to be healthier than 99% of people out there in the world. And so uh, next picture. We get to have a lot of fun. Um, this is Santa, by the way, getting adjusted at Christmas time. Um, about 20% of my practice is pediatric uh, because a lot of times, you know, we'll see children that come in with recurrent ear infections, asthma, allergy type issues, and those are all stress related disorders um, to the nervous system. That's how your body perceives the world is through your nervous system. And so, you know, you'll see kids that will crawl like in that army crawl with one leg. Um, you know, backwards there, or they can't, you know, they, they, they kind of walk funny or they walk on their tippy toes. Those are de neurologic developmental disorders that unless they're addressed, as we know that the nervous, like how we move, our cerebellum actually has an impact um, on your uh, prefrontal cortex on how you think. So for example, have you guys theoretically been sitting for a long time watching Zoom, right? And then all of a sudden you can't think right? Your brain just goes dead. And what do you have to do? You have to get up, you have to move, you have to walk around because that stimulates your brain. That's what makes us us to be able to think there. And so the challenge is, is that uh, yeah, you can keep, now you can get up and move. That's good. Um, so the point of that is, is that that's it's, people ask like, who should have chiropractic care? And I basically said it's womb to tomb. Like anybody that has a nervous system should probably at least know what their nervous system is looking like. Next picture. I also think that you, your practice and is your ability to express yourself. I think your practice is a reflection of who you are. Um, so I'm, I'm big on service. So every quarter we do a service project for the office. Um, so like this is uh, every every Christmas we go dr we, uh, drop off uh, complete food baskets on random people's doors uh, that you know our patients will give us names of people that are having hard times and we'll give them presents and gift certificates and. Uh, drop it off at their door. Um, we have uh, we we created partnerships like on the left hand side where people will just like bring in all their extra vegetables to the office, you know, from their gardens, and uh, they'll share it with our other patients. And because I think the biggest thing is is that I don't know if you guys noticed, but our our who we are as human beings is designed to be in community. We're designed to have relationships. We're designed to have connection. When you have that, you get oxytocin, which is your love and connection hormone. It's your anti stress, immune boosting. And I think that's what really makes a difference is that, um, you know, being in the sterile environment, you have, you guys have been this, you know, you go into the doctor's office, you sit on the table, some, the nurse comes in, they take your blood pressure um, and, uh, you know, they ask you a whole bunch of questions and then doctor comes in, he's on the clock, he's got 10 minutes there um, and uh, you have all these questions, but it's, you know, he doesn't have enough time to be able to, you know, really get to the root cause of your problems there. And so he's got to go, right? It's not his fault. It's just the way the system is set up. In fact, I asked my grandfather if he could go back into practice uh, because he start, you know, he started before eight insurance. He's 92 now. He started before insurance. He, then you know, he had insurance. Then you had HMOs. Then you had PPOs. Then you had networks. Then you had all these different things, right? I said, if you could go back, what would you do? As he said, I would go back and I would only practice half day, Meaning I would have, and I'd have a two room office, one room for the waiting room and one room for my exam room. And then I would do house calls like I did when I first started in practice in the second half, because I actually got to know who my patients were and understand them. Next, next one. So this is what the office looks like. Just to kind of give you an idea, uh, typical exam room. Um, we have these chairs that you see down here. I don't know why that white thing's there, but uh, this is the um, wobble room. Uh, we have, they do exercises before they get adjusted. We have supplements, not just to, not to treat something, but a lot of times I'm a firm believer and there's only two causes of, um, there's actually really one cause of disease. And you guys would probably agree with me on this is that it's a sick cell. When a cell sick, you can't have one cell sick. It's many cells are sick in the body. Um, and there's only two causes of a sick cell. You're either going to have a toxicity of something, something that's making the cell sick, or you're going to have a deficiency of something. Um, and so if we think of health from that perspective, it's either a toxicity or deficiency issue, then you have a very different discussion 
with your patient. What are you toxic in? What are you deficient in? And unfortunately, many times we try to fix that sick cell by make, giving, giving a patient something that actually makes them either more toxic or more deficient. So in fact, there's a great website called uh, My Tabin uh, that you can actually look at. And every medication actually causes nutrient deficiencies. So you can actually you know, go to your parents and take their list of medications and put it into My Tabin or your grandparents and it'll pop up a list of all the deficiencies that those medications cause. Um, and so this, I'm just, the reason why I'm going over this is I want you to think more holistically. And you know, a lot of times you'll get into the habit of seeing your patient as a diagnosis rather than a human being. And when you see them as a diagnosis, it's, a, it's just, it's like you're saying like you're, you're doing your biology labs, right? It just becomes a math equation. This ICD-9 code is equal to this. this is, then you have this treatment protocol to go with this. But they always say when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. I mean, it's think, yeah, to think horses, not zebras. But a lot of times when we miss the zebras, that's where we have a problem. Um, next question. I mean, next. Oh, there we go. I guess that there's our adjusting area. Um, that's so we have kind of an open adjusting area, and people are like, well, why don't you have it in enclosed rooms? What I find is it gives an opportunity for um, community also, um, and, uh, and so I can be talking and teaching. Uh, we do have private consultation rooms like the one to the right um, if a patient has any questions or if I need to do an exam. Uh, but primarily we do it out there so people can be in community there. Next, next one. Uh, this is just our big thing is trying to get out in the community uh, because I look around, you know, um, uh, in church, the prayer lists are getting longer, right? For people that are sick, you know, um, there's people out in the community that need to know this. This is, um, this is the Sharks uh, team. Uh, healthcare team on the left side. This is getting ready for a game down on the right hand side. Next question. Next one. I also think about bringing that community onto the inside. Um, this is actually one of the Sharks players with his family. So it's not just about them. Once they understand the, the benefits, um, you know, of, of what we do and they feel that they're like, I want the same thing for my family. Cause like, if you found out like there was something that you could do that would forever impact the life and health and the well being of your kids, would you do it? Right. And so when they understand how the body actually functions, they're like, hey, I, I wonder what my wife's spine looks like. I wonder what my kid's spine looks like. Um, and next one. I know it, I think one of the other thing is, is that it's all about education uh, because you know, during the whole presidential elections, I said, we're not voting for anybody, but we started our own political party and we made it into the campaign headquarters and it was, our whole campaign slogan was make America healthy again. Um, and I think one of the reasons we chose the, 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 uh, the buffalo, because there's a, a story about buffaloes and what they do is, the, and cows, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, in a, like a Cherokee story, where a cow sees a storm coming and it walks, it walks away from the storm. But the problem is, is that it's in the storm a lot longer. When a buffalo sees a storm coming, it heads right into the storm and it gets through the storm quicker. And so a lot of times, you know, you'll have it when you're working with a patient in the future, you'll be like, okay, I need you to start making some nutritional changes. And they're like, oh, you know, I really like my sugar. I'm not really to get ready to give up my soda. Um, I, you know, exercise, no, I've never done it. I don't like to do it. And you're gonna have to go into the storm and be a buffalo because otherwise that patient will be in the storm forever there. So it's really an important thing for us about setting expectation of what is possible for their health. And most people forgot, have forgotten that they could be healthy. Uh, they've forgotten that, um, that they can actually feel good again. They just, they, they wanna feel just less sick than they were before. And it's interesting because it's, uh, there's this interesting balance. Like if you think about last time you had the flu, okay? And so when you had the flu, you decided I'm gonna sleep more. I'm gonna drink my fluids. I'm gonna take my vitamin C and my supplements. I'm not gonna eat bad food. And then all of a sudden the flu goes away. And what do we start doing? We go back to the same thing we were doing, stressing out, staying up late, watching Netflix, you know, eating like, you know, frozen pizzas and all the things that got us sick in the first place. And so our job is to teach people a healthy lifestyle. Because if you live your life, then you stay, uh, uh, then you stay healthy. Next question. Um, just some more kids. Uh, but uh, really, I look at this is that it's the next generation, right? Um, and I think that uh, the next generation is that, you know, 42% of children right now already have a chronic diagnosis. Um, they have a chronic diagnosis and it, it's actually kind of a, it's kind of a scary thing. There's an old thing that they talk about uh, canaries in the gold, uh, canaries in the coal mines, where they would 
bring a canary in there and if the gas started coming out of the coal mines, if the birds would die first then they would know, the miners would know, oh my gosh, we need to start getting out of the, the coal mine because it's, it's lethal in here. Well, we started looking at our children with 42% of them actually having a chronic disease right now. The canary in the gold mine is, 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 is they're dying. And, uh, and nobody would, if you looked at like, for example, like a herd of wildebeest um, and like 40% of the, 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 the calves of, of wildebeest calves were sick and um, you wouldn't say, oh, it's a genetic thing. Does that make sense? You wouldn't say, oh, it's in their genes that they're gonna get sick in one generation. Um, you wouldn't say that they, that they um, you would ask like, what are they eating, right? What did, is, is there a toxin on the, on, the, on the grass that they're eating there? You would think it was something in their environment. And so that's really what we're trying to teach these kids. We, you know, we teach, we, we have the kids come out and exercise. We teach them how to read labels on cans there. Um, and it's just about giving people a, a power back and empowering them to have better health decisions. Next picture. Classes, we have classes all the time. We just had one on cardiovascular disease last night. Um, you know, and, I, and I, 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 a lot of times I found that it's harder to go one-to-one -one, meaning that it's just impossible for me to get to go one-to-one, -one, uh, meaning that we have 3.1 million people in the Silicon Valley right now, but 1.4 million of them actually have a chronic disease. I can't get to all of them. So the way that our approach is, is that, hey, let, let's put on classes on a regular basis and teach the information and have these people do things in community. Um, give, we have challenges going on in the office all the time to start getting them healthy. And then remember that, you know, they were born to be healthy and they're born to be victorious there. Uh, next one. Um, kind of an inch on the right hand side, you'll see uh, we have, these are uh, some of the women that are just in an exercise class uh, in our office. Um, and then sometimes on, we'll have, you know, 20, 40, 60 people outside in our parking lot, all exercising together. Um, this was a, uh, I started taking care of her when she was 16 years old. Um, she gets, she was a, a runway model and she was a scholarship basketball athlete, gets married and gets hit head on by a drunk driver um, out in the middle of the Utah desert. And um, it was a tough one. Um, she was in a coma for six months, and then they brought her back to California, brought her over to uh, Valley Med. She was in a coma there, and I went there and started adjusting her, and she came out of the coma. But they said, you know what, there's not going to be a, a chance that she's, she's going to be a vegetable for the rest of her life. Well, then she started talking, and they said, well, she's never going to walk. And then she started walking, and they said, well, she can talk and she can walk, but she's not going to be functional. And then she went back and got her master's degree at San Jose State uh, in special education. Uh, but at the same time, then she was still on 11 different medications, which they said she'd have to be on for the rest of your life. And these were the last four that she got off. They said your, your, your reproductive system was so damaged that you'll never be able to have a child. And uh, she has a child that was actually born on my birthday, um, who's now two years old. So I think a lot of times there's, there, we, we call that a miracle, but that's normal when we get healthy. Does that make sense? Miracles are supposed to happen. Um, and uh, when you're doing the right thing. And so I, I, I firmly believe that our bodies are intelligent. They know how to heal. You don't have to think to breathe. You don't have to think to digest. You don't have to, you know, your cells are reproducing every day. You don't have to think about that. Your job is just not to interfere with that process. There's a power that made your body. There's a power that heals your body and you just don't wanna interfere with it there. Next one. So here's what a typical case looks like, okay? So a patient comes in, this is a low back picture on the left-hand side. Um, normally, see the picture on the right? That's a, 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 what a normal low back curve would look like. The picture on the left is the, when she presented it into our office. Um, she presented with a, a condition called ulcerative colitis. Um, ulcerative colitis is an autoimmune disease. Um, and uh, basically, your body starts attacking your intestines. By the time she's 50, they're going to start clipping out parts of her intestines. She can only eat about... Uh, 15 to 20 different types of food. Otherwise, it throws her into pain. She gets bloated and uh, um, she starts bleeding. Um, you can actually see all the gas patterns on that left-hand side there. Um, what the heck is somebody coming into my office with an autoimmune disease with ulcerative colitis? Well, an autoimmune disease is just an end-stage stress reaction. And how does your body perceive stress? Through your nervous system. So if your nervous system's under stress, your body's not going to be able to perceive the world that's going to amplify it. But also your intestines actually 
control your, your, I mean, your nervous system controls your intestines there. Um, because I know this, if I cut the nerves that go to your intestines, what happens to your intestines? Are they gonna work or not? Even if you give the best food in the world, they're not gonna work. And if I have pressure on those nerves, are they gonna work or not? And where that L5 is right above the sacrum, it's pushing back on the nerves that go in the spinal cord and stretching that spinal cord that's going to the intestines. Picture on the right is the same lady uh, six weeks later. Okay, and if you look, the gas patterns are almost all gone. Um, the, uh, uh, she actually, on the 14th, she actually went out to her first Valentine's meal with her husband and had a normal meal or didn't have any reaction to it. And I asked her, I said, what, she didn't want to start care. Her husband's like, you need to come in. And, and I basically, I tell her, I said, look, there's one chance in a thousand we can help you. Would it be worth it? And she said, yeah. And I said, so, um, and I, she said, but you can't help me because if this is an autoimmune thing. And I said, okay, that means your body's stupid, right? It's gonna attack itself or is your body smart? We just gotta find out what's interfering with that intelligence. Next picture. So she comes in about six weeks after that picture on the left-hand side, she shows me this. You guys all know what that is, right? And she starts crying. I said, well, what's going on? This is awesome, right? This is, you're, you're, you're gonna have a baby. And she says, I, I, I can't do it again. I said, well, what do you mean? I can't do it again. She says, I, I, I can't have another miscarriage. She's already had seven miscarriages. By the way, those nerves down there at L5 that go to the intestines there also go to the uterus. So cause and effect, I don't know. I didn't adjust her to get her pregnant. Does that make sense? Like it was all about helping her body function. I didn't even adjust her to get rid of our immune disease. By the way, her migraine headaches also went away. Uh, next picture. But what I do know is this child right here wouldn't have been here if we hadn't done what we had done, there's, there's no medication that will correct that spine. Does that make sense? You can't, this is a structural issue, not a chemical issue. Next picture. So what I want you to think about next time you look at an x-ray, this is a cross section of what a lumbar spine looks like. These are the nerves that are in the lumbar spine. There's not a lot of room for error, error but those are delicate lifeline. Those are delicate communications um, that, uh, that, 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 that innervate and animate the entire body. Next question, I mean, next one. So the last thing is that we try to change the world. We try to, uh, you know, if you have a message that you want to get out, you want to make sure that you get it out to every person that you possibly can. Um, and so I think that that's why I'm on here with you guys, because I think that, um, you know, the world needs more healers, more people committed to getting people healthy, uh, more people that have a plan rather than waiting till somebody's in crisis. You know, a lot of times our healthcare system is set up for if you have, you, you get a mammogram every year, right? and you keep on radiating the breast until you have a cancer big enough to detect on a mammogram, and then you do a biopsy on it, and then you do radiation and chemo, and you, does that make sense? We wait till we're in crisis there. Well, what we do know is that it takes eight to nine years from the first time a cancer cell uh, changes for it to multiply enough for it to actually be detectable on a mammogram. So all the time that you, that person's saying negative, 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 they've, and then they finally show up with that positive on their mammogram, for the, the previous eight to nine years, they were actually developing cancer. We just didn't have the technology to detect it. And so I always, my philosophy is this, let's just live our lives as if we had cancer because every single one of us does have cancer. But what happens is we also have an immune system that keeps it, um, you know, and keeps it in check there. And that's the message that we want to get out. Next one. So this is the team, um, you know, and uh, I think one of the, the each one of them is, uh, is incredible. They all have a specialty, uh, meaning that uh, they're trained up and they're all passionate. Uh, every single one of them actually used to be patients, uh, and then they, except for the one next to Dr. Doss, but, uh, but they all wanted to, they wanted to come work for us because they had life transformation in their lives there too. Uh, next one. So here's the kind of the, probably the boring stuff, right? Or maybe this is where you guys have the questions. Um, I told you why I selected it as a career choice, uh, because I was looking for something that would um, make, help people become healthy. I wanted to be a leader. Um, I wanted to inspire people. Um, and I, it just made logical sense to me. Um, I, you know, and I, I, like I said, I, you know, I spent enough time. I grew up like the average person, you know, you have an ear infection, you go to the doctor and you get your, um, you know, antibiotics. Well, that was 40 years ago. And now we realize that we have bacteria that, um, are, that are like eating us. Does that make sense? Like, like we, we don't understand the unintended consequences of some of the actions there. Um, you know, we, a lot of the things that 
you know, they used to have, you guys have probably heard of a lobotomy, like back in the 50s, they used to have vans that would go from city to city, do their portable lobotomy places where you bring your child that was like a, like a troublemaker and they would give them a lobotomy. And then that, that was normal. Like, you know, my, my mom started smoking um, back in the 70s because she had constipation issues. And her doctor said, well, if you smoke cigarette, uh, cigarettes in the morning, then you know, it'll help you with your bowel movement in the morning. Like what I, what I, I needed something that was what we call an inside out approach, meaning that, um, that we needed to, I think things to me have to be logical and sometimes we overthink things. Um, and so that's why I really chose chiropractic as a career because your brain controls everything. And if it's interfered with your body's not gonna work right. And our job is just to remove those interferences. As far as the chiropractor versus a, a, a medical or a PA or a nurse practitioner, very different. Um, you know, one's trying to, um, your chiropractor is looking at, okay, what's the cause? A lot of times the medical doctor will look at the cause, but let's say you go in there and you say, oh, you have high blood pressure. What's he going to do? He's not going to say, um, oh, what's going on in your life? You know, did a wildebeest chase you into the, a tiger chase you into the office, right? What are the stresses like in your life? How can we manage some of those lifestyle things? Because your body doesn't do anything dumb. It is just it, like blood pressure is just a normal result of stress. Like if you're under stress, of course your blood pressure is going to go up. Um, and so um, it's I think they're they're very different approaches to healthcare. It doesn't mean one's right or wrong. Uh, but the easiest way I explain it to people many times is this: is that if there was a fire right um, in your house, and you're not going to call the contractor uh, to come put out the fire, right? Maybe there's faulty wiring, maybe there was a leak somewhere, or a gas leak. You're gonna call the fire department and the fire department's job is to save your house and to save your life. And they're gonna come in with their hoses and their axes and they're gonna do what their job is, is to put the fire out. Um, then after the fire, you're not gonna call the fire department back and say, hey, can you come and fix my house? Because they only have tools for putting out the fire. You're gonna call the contractor. The contractor is gonna go in there fix the wiring so it doesn't like, you know, it doesn't catch fire again, you know, put the new baseboard on there, you know, paint, put the paint back on there. And so the, the analogy that I use is, is, you know, our healthcare system is we are the best country in the world for crisis care. Literally, like if you're having a heart attack, I want to be in the United States. Okay. If I'm having a heart attack in the United States, I want somebody to save my life right now. I want them to give me whatever you need to give me, save my life, keep it going so I can live another day to actually fix the problem that caused it in the first place. I want to, you know, don't put me on five, you know, the, what they call the basic five after I have a heart attack and leave me on there for the rest of my life. Help me change my lifestyle so it doesn't happen again. And so that would be the difference, um, you know, it's a, a, as far as the philosophy, I, as far as my scope of practice here in California, I can do anything except puncture the skin or prescribe medication. Um, you know, I can sign a death certificate, birth certificate. I can put, you know, commit somebody to an insane asylum. Um, I didn't do that with my kids, but sometimes I felt like I should have. Um, as I talk, we talked about their prerequisites. Um, you know, it's 90 hour and uh, 90 units. Uh, you know, you can always call the colleges. They're very good about giving you information and uh, they have a lot of great resources and videos. Just put your name in, they'll send you stuff there. Uh, I think that as far as factors to, uh, to consider when um, uh, selecting a chiropractic college is actually really important. Um, there's different, just like there's different types of lawyers, there's different types of dentists, you know, there's, you know, different, there's, there's a, there's a, such a wide breadth of chiropractic. Um, you have some schools that are, um, they, they want to um, do um, like, you know, almost practice medicine, but as an alternative. Does that make sense? Like, okay, you have cholesterol medications. Let me give you an alternative cholesterol medication. Um, you know, then you, so there's a, uh, you know, some of them are more focused on just rehabilitation um, and, you know, getting people out of pain and um, different schools or other schools are like, hey, let's just focus on making as many people as healthy as we possibly can. So, you know, here there's a, you know, and if you see the two local schools, Palmer West, which is in San Jose, and you compare them to LifeList, there'll be very different fields, but it depends on what you need there. Um, as far as uh, up, like if for pre-chiropractic applicants, they each of the, there is, I think, a pre-chiropractic program at almost every school. Um, the letters of recommendation, um, shoot, um, 
come spend a day at the office and then I'll give you a letter of recommendation. Um, and I, in fact, I invite you guys all to, you know, out sometime you can come, you know, observe during a shift or spend a day in the office, especially during the summer, if you have time, you're always welcome. Um, uh, next slide. So pro tip um, to pre-chiropractic students. This is, I think the best pro tip is that um, don't just listen to me. Um, I would get out and if you were interested in, in chiropractic, I would get out to as many chiropractors as I possibly could. Um, and just because there's, you know, it's, it's a science, it's a philosophy and it's an art. Um, so the science doesn't change, the philosophy doesn't change, it's the art. It's just like some people like Monet, some people like Renoir, uh, I mean Rembrandt, right? Uh, some people like Picasso, for goodness sakes. But the point is, is that everybody's different. And, um, and so it's the art. And so you, the more chiropractors that you see, the, the more that you observe, you'll see what style of practice you like, what style of practice you don't like there. Next one. Um, next picture, let's see if that came through. There we go. So for you, Amy, and your sore bottom from sitting there all the time, um, I put together a video uh, for you guys. And it has all the, uh, the, the work out there. Uh, it's a, it's about a six minute posture exercise that you can do that will literally kind of reset your posture in your body and, uh, and make you feel like a lot of those, uh, the stiffness and the aches and pains, like I'm feeling sitting on the couch for the last hour, um, uh, will go away there. So I put that in there as a link to you guys. You can just go onto my website. You can just, it's like drtjosborne.com. And uh, there's a special exercise section on there. You can link to it on there, or you can just take it from this right there. Uh, next picture. Now it's time for the Q&A session. So hopefully I didn't talk too much, um, or hopefully I talked just enough, but I, I'd love to see you know, what questions you guys have. And uh, um, you know, if, if anything that I said had an impact on you, so. Oh, oh I see you go first. <laughs> yeah. are, you talking, are you talking to me, Amy, or are you talking to someone else? I'm talking to you. <laughs> oh, okay. If you want to go, you can. I just, okay. Okay. I, I guess I have a question. First, thank you so much for telling us about your journey and um, giving us some advice. We really appreciate your time. Um, I do have a question. How do you become a consulting doctor for a for a team, like for example, I know I know I'm dreaming a little too hard, a little too hard. But like I was like, oh my god, if I could be like a physician for like an NBA team, wow! Like one day when I'm like 60 years old or 50 years old, how realistic is that? You know? Well, so here's the thing. It's actually a great question. Um, a lot of times people are like, okay, I'm going to go and become the physician for this team. Um, first of all, it's what you. A lot of times it, 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 it's about you being the very best you. You have to be a master at what you do. Um, and then people will know you for it. So you can't just go get it. Does that make sense? In fact, it probably cost you. I know Kaiser, for example, probably spends several million dollars being the uh, uh, team doctors for the Sharks every year. Uh, like they, they literally like buy that right to be able to do that. Um, and so, um, it, it, like you, you can buy your way in there. Um, but what happens is, is that you wouldn't, you know, it, but for me being there, it started with me taking care of like a person who knew this person and said, oh, and then they were having a problem on the team and then they got great results and they started telling everybody else on the team and then they got great results and then they brought me in there. So I think that's, you know, it, it, the best way to be able to get something like that is yes, stay focused on it, keep it as your dream, keep it as your focus, but also be very, it has to be an organic thing. Other, other, otherwise you have to purchase the, the right to be able to do that. Absolutely. Okay, cool. 